Hi, everyone. I have to say that um, Michael made two great points. One is, um, in my role uh, as director of special projects, and it's a new role, but in the past um, five months, I've been able to be air traffic control over at the Shorenstein Center of all the projects we have funded and going on in journalism at this very pivotal moment. And I would agree with him that there's no one in any ivory tower that can tell me we've solved this. Um, we've brought two key players from our team here today. Um, Cameron and Ashka, Cameron Hickey and Ashka Dave are both on our information disorder project and I'm going to let them do a lot of the talking. I'll try and ask some questions but they have a wealth of information that I think you'll want to hear about on how we're looking at cleaning up the social media pipelines. Um, our focus at the Shorenstein Center is on media politics and public policy so we are definitely very focused on the midterms and the 2020 election in trying to get some sort of um, organization around this new media ecosystem. Uh, we also have a project on platform accountability on the go and business models for local news and news deserts. So we have a lot going on at the Shorenstein Center and we have not solved this problem yet, but we're getting closer and we have some very smart minds thinking about it. I want to introduce our panel. Peter Canellis is here with us. He's a former Boston Globe reporter, uh, notably editor-at-large at Politico, and so I'm actually really looking forward to hearing from Peter. We have not met before, except online, and I know he has a wealth of information both, both on nation states um, and time in Russia, uh, and also just to help us understand from a very old school perspective um, the newsroom. And, and when we ask about who is the health reporter today. Um, on the next panel, Karen Weintraub's on that panel. Um, she is, I think that if you have a journalist who has sat in an old school newsroom, you can bet that they understand the tenets of journalism. And I would look for that when you're following people. Not to say those of us, I was not in a print newsroom, I was in radio and documentaries, but if you, someone has been a cub reporter, you can bet that they're going to give you some very straight facts. Um, Ashka comes to us from MIT recently finishing her master's um, in comparative media studies and she actually did her thesis, and I'll let her talk to it, around the Washington Post and the CDC's coverage um, of uh, Ebola. So um, I think she has uh, some interesting uh, information to give us on this whole idea of how we amplify um, news in this clickbait culture, not that we want to do that, but the revenue model is set up for this amplification, and then when you have a moment of um, political breaking news or outbreak or climate disaster, how do we get to facts so that we're not creating some sort of hysteria? And then Cameron, I really am excited for you to hear from today. He has a number of slides to walk you through um, the information disorder. He's been deeply into it. Uh, uh, he's an Emmy Award winning journalist. Um, he has been at PBS for the last 10 years covering science and technology. And he is leading a lot of the technology uh, thinking in our journalism project around information disorder. So we have a great panel and I'll get to it. So. Um, so when everyone's asking who is that journalist, I will raise my hand. I, I, in fact, was that journalist for the last 10 years. At the PBS NewsHour, I did a lot of reporting um, on science and technology, and in particular, we did focus on health-oriented issues. We were in uh, West Africa covering Ebola and the science around that. We were in Brazil covering the Zika outbreak, again, looking at the science of it. So trying to think about ways that you responsibly cover these outbreaks and share information with an American audience that helps them to understand it and contextualize it better and not uh, raise the level of fear and paranoia. So I've definitely spent a lot of time thinking about those issues, but bizarrely, that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Um, we uh, focus in our lab on this concept called uh, information disorder. Um, this is, uh, I, I actually was just recognizing this morning that this sounds like uh, something that should uh, come up in a health context, right? This is a problem afflicting our population at large. Um, specifically, what we're talking about is this problem, that disinformation continues to spread across social media. We've been talking about it all morning already. Um, Mike, our keynote uh, speaker actually stole a bunch of the uh, information I'm about to present to you now, but I think it was a really good introduction to it, so I'm going to 
dive in and give you some deep context about it. Uh, those, those seven forms of mis and disinformation that he talked about, those come from the leader of our project, Claire Wardle, um, and a bunch of research she's done to understand this phenomenon and classify it more accurately. So I want to go through and give you some examples. Uh, these are all examples pulled from our work and the things that we've identified, and they're really all politically oriented, but I think that's important to understand because this is where the conversation is right now online, and it will be that way, we expect, through the midterms and again through uh, the next election in 2020, but in the lull in between, we expect to be a lot more focused on the kinds of issues that we're talking about today. Um, so let me start from the beginning. Fabricated content, to think about what this really means, uh, this is a meme image that was circulated widely a couple months ago, uh, drawing on a widely held conspiracy theory that George Soros is involved in putting his money into every liberal, democratic, or Antifa interest there is, and in fact that beyond that he may in fact be related to a major democratic lawmaker. Um, this particular image uh, connects to um, his son and suggests his son is married to um, Adam Schiff's sister. In fact, he was married to someone with that name, but that woman is in no way related to um, Adam Schiff. So this is a completely false fabricated idea that was easily and essentially instantly verified. But because the people who create these things like to tease us, the public and the journalists, they made sure to put right at the bottom, you can't make this up. Um, this is another, I think, really important form of mis- uh, or disinformation, even in this case, uh, that we see a lot. Um, it's, it's described here as false context. And I'm actually going to read what it says, and I want everybody to sort of think about it for a minute. In this tweet, it says, illegal aliens are far more likely to commit federal crimes based on statistics. They're 7% of the population, yet they commit 72% of drug possessions, 33% of money laundering, 29% of drug trafficking, 22% of murders, and 18% of fraud. Build that wall. Um, these stats didn't come from nowhere. Tucker Carlson uh, presented them on Fox News, I think back at the beginning of the year, and a version of these same stats has circulated uh, on Fox News and other sources back as far as we've identified at least since uh, 2015. Um, I'd sort of ask you when you look at that and when you think about the world that we live in, do these stats make sense to you? Who, who here believes these stats? Raise your hand if you believe them. Who thinks they're false? The really chilling thing is, these stats are actually accurate. We fact check them. They're, they're, they're true based on the information contained in this tweet. And there's one critical piece of context that, that is unclear here, and that's the use of the term federal crimes. So most crimes are not prosecuted at the federal level. In fact, uh, non-immigrants are disproportionately represented in federal prosecutions, and we haven't dug into the details to explain exactly why that is, but we suspect that a lot of federal crimes involve immigration crimes as well, and so that is why these numbers are really skewed in one direction. There isn't equivalent data nationally around these same uh, crime statistics, but you can see recognizing that a platform like Fox News felt comfortable stating these factually accurate stats, that they could be misused in a way that really changes public perception around this issue of quote unquote illegal immigrants and the problem that they create for us. Um, so that's how something that can be true can be pre presented with a context that's not entirely accurate that completely changes how important it is to the public discourse. Um, another example, and just I, I picked this one because I want to make it clear, we're finding a lot of mis- and disinformation, and it does not all lean on the right. There's a lot that is left-leaning as well. This concept of false connection. So this is a post I found from just a couple of days ago um, that says, Trump says, Declara Declaration of Independence, not true. All men are created equal. It's a very confusing phrase to a lot of people. Now, the two items in quotes, those are, in fact, quotes from, uh, I believe it was an NPR reporter, um, but he never declared that the Declaration of Independence is not true. But, but this headline, especially if you don't read, or as we've talked a little bit about previously, um, if this appears inside of a Facebook post and that's all you ever got, you could very easily take this bit of false connection and read it as fact once again. So you're easily misled about how much more you ought to hate Donald Trump than you do today. Um, another form of content that we see quite a lot is imposter content. Um, you've heard a lot about this probably in the aftermath of the 2016 election, talking about 
quote unquote fake news sites and sites that look like real ones. This one appeared, I think about eight or nine days ago and it's called the New York Herald. It has the domain name, I believe it is, thenyherald.com. The New York Herald has, hasn't been a pub paper that's published since I think the 1930s. It did evolve into the, uh, a, a number of different newspapers after that, but this isn't a real newspaper. In fact, most of the links on this site aren't real at all. Um, Two or three of them have content, and then all of the rest link to the exact same text that might as well be, you know, lorem ipsum text. But this appeared and content was getting shared across Facebook, and for a lot of people, that looks like as credible a news source as the New York Daily News or the New York Times. Um, this one is one you may have heard of a lot, and this is what we call manipulated content. This image is from a Teen Vogue uh, cover shoot in which Emma Gonzalez, one of the Parkland uh, shooting survivors uh, was originally tearing apart a shooting target, right? So a, a target practice target that was a bunch of circles. It, on 4chan, people that we frequently refer to as trolls said, let's fix this, let's make this more real, and they instead ha photoshopped uh, into this the Declaration of Independence. It got a ton of circulation the very following day and um, it was frequently debunked. However, the image itself was shared and had made such an impact that it's hard to say how many people recognized which one was the real one and which one was the fabricated or uh, manipulated version. Um, and the last kind that we talk about and think about a lot is satire. And satire can be entertaining, it can be fun, but it can also create real problems. And this is an uh, interesting example. It comes from a Facebook page called The Last Line of Defense that we tra track a lot. And I'll just read it out to you. Congresswoman Atisha Nubbins, Delaware, pushed through HB 814U. It will put an upper age limit on voting, uh, eliminating all voters over the age of 60. Um, well, I may think this is a great idea since I'm not over 60. Most people probably had a negative reaction to this idea. Uh, I got a ton of social media shares. And if you looked at the engagement on those, what you saw was a lot of people commenting on, what an awful idea. I can't believe the Democrats are trying to do this too. This is horrible. A quick verification on this, Atisha Nubbins is not the representative from Delaware. There is no such bill like this. In fact, this image was stolen from somewhere else and is actually a media executive, this woman, unfortunately for her. Um, the website and Facebook page where this was posted uh, clearly states that it's satire. Uh, the, the guy who creates it, his name is actually, or his uh, internet handle is Bust a Troll. But the troll creates content like this every day to troll conservatives who he believes he's tricking by creating things that, that cast liberals in a bad light. The, the fact of the matter is the followers of this Facebook page that he has frequently believe it. They share and reshare and complain about how egregious this problem is. So even when people are making a joke, the risk is real, right? So, to, to summarize, this is that, that list, the same list that we heard from uh, Mike earlier. Um, and these are what we call information disorder. This is the, the broad phenomenon of information disorder. And all of these concepts apply whether we're talking about politics or whether we're talking about health, right? These same issues can crop up and you can start to imagine all the exact same ways you've seen it in the past or we might see it in the future. Um, but so when we talk about what that content is, all those examples that I gave, what, what, do, what do we really mean when we say that? And we heard this term a lot, right? But for us, we never use this term. We don't think this term is, is really inaccurate uh, description and is, is problematic in a number of ways, and I'll, I'll explain why. First, it, it isn't really always news, right? We all know that. Um, disinformation itself isn't always fake. I gave you a couple of great examples of that already. Um, and fake news itself, that term has been co-opted, right? It no longer means what we thought it meant a while ago. The term I like to use is junk news. Um, actually, in this context, it has a useful health uh, connotation because I think of it a lot like junk food, right? Some of it's really, really bad for you and you should never have it, but occasionally some people really like it. You know, you like a little taste of it. I certainly know my grandmother likes a lot of it. Um, so when we're talking about what, what is junk news, and in our context we're talking about political junk news, but I think the same applies. Um, if this is everything that's junk, then all of the different things we've talked about, they fit into it, right? It's certainly everything that's fabricated. It's a whole lot of clickbait content. It's a whole lot of hyper-partisan content. Frequently it's plagiarism. We see a whole lot of that. Um, it's definitely most of the stuff that's misleading, and occasionally it's even satire, right? So 
What are the symptoms? I, I wanted to use that word today because in this health context, it seems to make sense. Um, these are the symptoms or the, the signals that we use to identify what junk news is, right? So if it has a clickbait headline, that might be an indicator that's junk. Um, if there's a missing or fake byline, we frequently identify it like that. Is there false, misleading, or inaccurate uh, content or context? Is there plagiarism? Um, then are there low quality ads? And I see this actually a lot in, on health websites. You can kind of tell how trustworthy a health website is by the ads that appear alongside of it, right? Um, and then certainly is there partisan rhetoric, inflammatory tone, or hate speech? Those are uh, indicators not alone, but in conjunction with the others. We frequently identify junk news that way. And then these are some more technical um, ideas that we focus on. Is the domain itself young? I pointed to the New York uh, Herald website earlier. That one's less than two weeks old, right? It was registered two weeks ago. So that's a really strong indicator for us. And do we see that content coming from a bunch of different sites? Uh, do a bunch of sites that seem like they're unrelated actually publish a lot of the same content? And we actually see this a lot in health news as well. Um, and it's a, it's a really strong indicator that this is, there's an attempt to disinform the public using this content. So I want to give you just some broader context, and then I'll be finished. I see this red light blinking. Um, a couple of months ago, we brought uh, 120 plus journalists from 70 news organizations to the Shorenstein Center to have a big discussion of all of these issues. Um, as an experiment, I collected all of their Facebook pages. Um, actually, I had somebody else collect them for me. And then I uh, extracted what are their Facebook fan bases. And this is a, a graph. Be mindful that the, the scale on the left is logarithmic, but this is a graph of how big their, their audiences are, right? So BBC far at the left has uh, nearly 50 million Facebook fans, New York Times, Washington Post, all the mainstream news sources on down, right? I think my old organization, PBS NewsHour, is some in the, somewhere in the middle. Um, we also track a bunch of junk news sources, and so I did the same thing with those junk news sources. And these are the top 60, 70 odd junk news sources that are in our database, or were in our database two months ago. Um, and you can see the, the scale of their audience here as well. This matters when you look at them together, right? What we recognize is that the volume of information coming out of these junk news sources has uh, is greater than what we're seeing out of our mainstream news sources, and their reach is equivalent, or if you take it in aggregate, much greater, right? So wh whatever efforts you do to communicate what's important about global health to mainstream media, we have to be aware that these other sources have greater reach right now in a lot of cases, and in fact, much greater engagement on social media. So the risk is way outsized to the tools that we have to fight the problem. So I'm going to leave it there and let uh, I think. Thanks, Cameron.